make your way to your seats and remain standing. I'm going to read just a few verses of Scripture today as we hasten to the Word. Titus chapter 2. Verse number 11, this one will be familiar. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. For just a little while today, I want to preach about grace is amazing. Grace is amazing. We love you so much, Jesus. I pray for the next few minutes, God, that you would anoint our minds and hearts to receive your word today. You would fulfill your purpose in this place. In Jesus' name we pray and amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you all for your participation and the fun we're having with Be the Church Sunday. Hope you, you know we're just having some fun and trying to get us all excited about a great day to celebrate with our friends and our neighbors. I do have a little issue with the, with the uh, center point feud game. I'm not quite sure how the DMV made the list of things you have to do and the church did not. I think whoever came up with that really needs to pray hard and seek after God. When a person works an eight hour day and they receive a fair day's pay for that time, that is called a wage. When a person competes with an opponent to receive a trophy after their work, that is considered a prize. When a person receives appropriate recognition for their long service and, and their high achievements and commitments that is there, that is considered an award. When a person is not capable or able of earning a wage and can win no prize and really deserves no award, yet receives such a gift anyway, that is a great picture of God's unmerited favor and that is what we call the grace of God. I've seen before where they've taken the letters of grace and made an acronym out of it and simply referred to it as God's riches at Christ's expense. But I believe there's a lot more to grace than simply that. Grace is one of the commodities that allows God to be what His holiness would never let Him be. Go with me for a minute before you turn me off. Let me, let me say this. Grace is the spiritual golden gate between man's sin and God's goodness. It is the horizon that blends an infinite sky into the finite earth. It is the possible juncture between an irresistible force and an immovable object. I believe that the psalmist said it best in Psalms 85 and 10 when he said, Steadfast love and faithfulness meet, righteousness and peace kiss each other. Grace is amazing. Grace equals God's unmerited favor in our lives. Salvation equals nothing less than the Lord Jesus Christ himself because the very name Jesus simply means Jehovah has become our salvation. The Old Testament prophet Isaiah said in chapter 12 verse 3, Therefore with joy shall you draw waters out of the wells of salvation. Since we know that the name Jesus means Jehovah has become our salvation, that verse if you did a literal interpretation, would simply mean and say that we have drawn out of Jesus our salvation. We know that the grace of God, according to what Paul wrote to Titus, has appeared unto all men. One verse or one translation puts it this way. The grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared and hath been made to shine from above. That phrase there, hath appeared unto all men, is the same way as saying what Simeon said, and we read oftentimes during the Advent Christmas time when he is holding the Christ child in his hand in Luke chapter 2 verse 29, Lord, now let your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared before the faces of all people. The grace of God was embodied in Jesus. He was, according to Scripture, the brightness of the Father's glory. He was manifested. He was the Son of righteousness. He was the Word made flesh and dwelt among us. When you see Jesus Christ, you see the personification of grace. 
It reminds me of the old song we used to sing when I was a kid. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. I'm, I'm talking about the fact that grace is amazing. Grace is astonishing, is astounding, is remarkable, is wonderful, is magnificent, is breathtaking, incredible, startling, surprising, shocking, marvelous, miraculous grace. Grace, grace. God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace. God's grace. Grace that is greater than all my sin. I'm reaching for somebody today. Somebody came in dejected and, and, and torn. Somebody came into this room today beat down because of decisions that have happened to you and things that you have done, thinking that you're unworthy. But I want you to know you're in this room today and God knows that. It's not a mistake that you're here. He's not a mistake that I'm preaching about grace today. It's not a mistake that you're feeling this way. But I want you to know God's grace covers over all sins. All sins. There's been no decision you've made. There's been no circumstance you've been involved with. There's been no label placed on you that His grace cannot cover. His grace is amazing. His grace is covering. His grace is miraculous. I don't know where you are and what you're going through, but I'm here to declare a truth to you today. God God's grace is amazing. Grace could have stood by itself. But I love the fact that whatever God does, he multiplies the effect and the impact in our life. John said this in chapter 1 of his gospel. He said, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of Him and cried out, saying, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for He was before me, and in His fullness we have received. And grace for grace. Grace for grace. Grace is amazing in its fullness, but there's so much more to it than that. When Satan went before God in Job chapter 2, verse number 4, so Satan went and answered the Lord saying, skin for skin, yes, all that man has he will give for his life. He was talking about the reason that Job was, was serving after God is because it was in his best interest to do so. That's the only reason he was doing it. But in that same terminology, in that same framework inside a sentence structure, we see John saying here it was about grace for grace. Skin for skin is skin after skin. Man will give all that he has to save his own flesh and blood. But grace for grace is a different story. It's grace after grace. It's abundance of grace. It's grace upon grace. Once grace is heaped upon another part of grace, simply this, you can't outrun the grace of God. You can't go too far that His grace won't reach for you. It doesn't matter how far the depths you have fallen. His grace is still there available for you in your life. We can't even begin to understand the grace of God. It's beyond our comprehension how wonderful and magnificent and amazing God's grace really is. Grace is amazing in its promise. In the Old Testament, you read through the scriptures, oftentimes you see where it is written in there and we find mercy and truth being put together. Mercy was according to the promise that God had given His people. So here, grace and truth speaks of the grace according to God's promises. He keeps His word. He's a God who keeps His word. I got to sit here for a minute until you really get that. He's a God who keeps His word. Somebody in this room, God has spoke a word into you and it hadn't come to pass yet and you're feeling a little bit dejected. You're feeling a, bit, a little bit let down. You're feeling a little bit weary trying to hold on to something that seems now as if it's something that's just empty and meaningless. But I promise you, God keeps His Word. God keeps His promises. 1 Kings 8 and 56. Blessed be the Lord who hath given rest to His people of Israel according to all that He has promised. There hath not failed one word of all His good promise which He promised to His servant Moses. God keeps His Word. And there are promises in this book that if you will do your part and I will do my part, these promises are guaranteed because God spoke them into our life. Grace is the substance of all the Old Testament types and shadows because grace is amazing in its person. 
There was something of grace in the ordinances given to Israel that the providence granted to Israel for they didn't know that I can trust in God. God proved this to him. When he showed up in Egypt and they were enslaved in sin, God proved that he could back up his word, that he was going to deliver them out of their enslavement. And he, and he not only did that, but he proved to the Egyptians that he was the God. It didn't matter how many gods they had, he had the plagues to counteract every one of their gods to prove that he was more powerful than anything that man would come up with. But after he delivered them out, after he had proven himself that he was a God who could keep his word, he said, now here's the deal. I'm going to give you some law because I want you to be my people and I want you to belong to me. But it was just a type and a shadow of something that was greater to come and down the road. The very best blessings that God heaped upon Israel were only shadows of good things that were coming to the church. They had the law, but we have grace revealed in Jesus Christ because he was the true sacrificial lamb, the true scapegoat. He was the true manna. They had bread that showed up in the morning and in the evening, but we have access to him anytime we want. We have access to his word anytime we want. We have such a better deal than what they were given. They were given some hope, but it was simply a shadow of greatness that was to come. They had grace in a picture, but we have grace in a person. Woo! We have grace in a person and that person is making himself available in this room today. He has taken up residence in many of us in this place. He has filled us with his spirit. How amazing is that? How amazing is God's grace? Oh, it's not, it's not just for one. It's not just for a select few. It's not just for the high priest. But that that veil was rent in the temple when he said it was finished. What was he doing? He was separating what was and what was to come. The promise was being fulfilled. No longer do I have to have a high priest that I go to. No longer do I have to make a sacrifice myself. But my great God robed himself in flesh and he died on the cross to abolish, to take away the penalty of sin that was rightly due me. He did his part so now I have access. You have access to him and his spirit is alive alive and well and not only is it in this room but there are many of us who are saying it's inside of me I feel like the old prophet it's like fire shut up in my bones what is it it is the grace the amazing grace of my God oh how wonderful the grace of God is how amazing is grace I submit to you today that this grace is far more amazing than you can imagine. We have yet to comprehend the fullness of God's grace. There's times, there's moments in our life where we reflect back on His goodness. Many testimonies are in this room today of times when God showed up and miraculously did things that were beyond your comprehension. Do I have any witnesses here today that say he's a God of grace and mercy? Anybody who says, I've lived in that grace and mercy in my life. I didn't deserve it. I wasn't faithful. He was faithful. I wasn't faithful. He was faithful. I wasn't committed. He was committed. I paid lip service many times in my life and I've never one time deserved the mercy and grace he's given me. But thanks be to God that he didn't base it off of my qualifications, but he was willing to be qualified himself and he gave me his grace and mercy. So amazing this grace that it strips the judge's verdict off of every one of us. It turns our pride and arrogance inside out. It makes all of our righteousness as filthy rags. We have no right to criticize any recipient of God's grace. We have no justification to deny God's grace to anyone who seeks it. We have no power to take away God's grace from anyone who gets it. Every one of us has a ministry. Every one of us has a ministry. And every minister is charged with teaching and preaching and living out the word of God. But it's also for you and I to be a steward of God's grace. I'll show you the word says so. First Peter 4 and 10. As each one has received a gift, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace 
of God. Who are you to set in judgment when God pours His grace out on mercy on anyone? Uh, thanks be to God that He's not making you and I be qualified, nor anybody else be qualified. Calvary was the qualification for every man, woman, and child to receive His mercy and His grace, and I'm thankful for that. You have never looked at someone. You have never seen anyone. You have never interacted with someone that God does not love just as much as He loves you. His grace and His mercy. Grace is our only claim to salvation. Stay with me. Grace does not come by believing, but believing comes by grace. Grace does not come by repentance, but repentance comes by grace. Grace does not come by baptism, but baptism and remission of sins comes by grace. Grace does not come by the Spirit, but the Spirit comes by grace. Thanks be to God for His mercy and His amazing grace. Paul writing to the church. Paul writing to the church. Who's Paul writing to? He's writing to the church at Ephesus, says in Ephesians 2. And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and the power of the air, the spirit of who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom we also once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, whew, I love it when it says, but God. I love what follows that conjunction. But God. But God, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages he come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Oh, thank God for grace. When we think of heaven as a vast place of, of untold wealth and riches and jewels, streets of gold, walls of jasper, gates of pearl, all the things that we put stock in and we think have so much valuable are construction material in heaven. Yeah, it's like a piece of sheetrock or a two before. It doesn't mean anything to God. He paves the streets with the stuff that we think is of the most value. We walk on it with her. But he keeps a list and he keeps a record of what he values the most, just like you and I do. We keep lists, whether it's a mental list or a list on your phone or a list somewhere in a vault. We keep a list of the things that's most valuable to us. He has a list too. It's called the Lamb's Book of Life. And in it, he has a list of the redeemed. Of the redeemed. It's not about gold. It's not about jasper. It's not about pearls. It's not about all those things that we think are costly that make you status and makes you important. That's nothing. That's just construction stuff to him. But he keeps a list of what's valuable. The redeemed, the redeemed, the redeemed. Oh, let the redeemed of the Lord say so that his grace is amazing. I've got my name written in the Lamb's book of life. What possible accolade could be placed upon me that's higher than that in this world? What title or status could you give me that is higher than to know that my name is written? My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. That's the best list that you can ever make. And here's the deal. The only thing that disqualifies you is you. His grace is for you. Regardless of what you've done. His grace is that's what's so amazing about grace. How beautiful His grace is. When you look in heaven, you find stacks and stacks of mercy and grace. Not platinum and gold, not silver and pearl, but stacks of grace and mercy. Micah 7 and 18. Who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgressions of the remnant of his heritage, he does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. Not in gold, not in jasper, not in platinum. No, 
No, He delights and He loves to give out His mercy. He loves to give out His grace. He loves to write names down in the book of life. He loves it. He loves it. He loves it. How amazing is God's grace? God is rich in mercy and exceedingly rich in grace. He is not counting His gold. He's counting His redeemed. Grace may be wonderful, but it does not leave us to wonder. It is real. It is measurable. It is evident. Acts chapter 11. Luke writing the accounts, this history here of the church. He says in 18 of chapter 11, when they heard these things, they became silent. And they glorified God saying, then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance of life. Verse 22 then the news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. And when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them with all purpose of heart they should continue with what was going on. He went and seen that it wasn't just for them. Hold oh, that out to excite everybody in this room because I doubt there are very many Jews in this room. But it was a bunch of Gentiles that God's spirit got poured out on. It was a bunch of us. And they showed up and said, look, look, he, he is abundant in grace and mercy. It's flowing. It's not just for the Jews, but it's for every man that wants it. Every man that desires it. It's available to them. When you see somebody repenting, you're seeing God's grace in action. That's what you see. When you, when you see somebody go and be baptized in the name of Jesus for remission of sins, you're seeing God's grace at work. When you see someone being filled with His Spirit, you are seeing God's grace. Center point, we bask in God's grace continually, but I'm afraid we take it for granted far too often. What's going on? The miraculous is happening all around us. It's His grace and His mercy that you and I get to live in. God's grace is amazing. Grace is a place. Romans 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have also access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope and the glory of God. Grace is not a license to sin. No, ladies and gentlemen, it is a refuge from sin that I can run into grace. And when I find myself being weak and I find myself being tempted and I find myself being overwhelmed by the things of life, by the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, I don't have to succumb to that, but I can run to grace. I can run to grace. I don't have to be captivated by these things. I can turn from that and I can choose Him. I can run to the place where grace is. Oh, grace is not weak. It's quite the opposite. It teaches aggressively and effectively. As I said to start this message, for the grace of God in Titus 2.11, for the grace of God that brings salvation, had the Peter and all men teaching us. Grace is a teacher. It's a teacher. How well are we learning the lessons? Denying ungodliness and worldly lust that we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. Grace has standards, principles, and boundaries. Grace loves righteousness, godliness, and temperance. Grace knows how to say no to sin. Grace knows how to say no to sin. Grace despises the sin even as it loves the sinner. Grace ever leads us along a safe and protected pathway. It's not laissez-faire. It's not a do your own way, be your own person. No, grace teaches us and guides us and coaches us and influences us in every aspect of our life. And I know you heard me say it many times, grace is a higher law than the law ever was. Grace is the shadowing response of God to the sinfulness of the world. I go back to Romans 5 to show you this. Verse 20, moreover the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigneth in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Everything the enemy tries to throw at it, grace says I'm bigger. Everything the enemy tries to do, he says my grace is bigger than that. My grace is bigger than that. But, but God, you don't understand. No, no, you don't understand. Son, daughter, child, 
You don't understand. My grace is bigger than any failure you have ever committed. My grace is bigger than any, any, any fault you may think you have. My grace is bigger. It covers farther than you can ever imagine. You can't comprehend the depths of His grace and mercy. It's not a license to do whatever you want. Instead, it's an understanding that I don't have to stay down. I can stand up in His grace. I can run to Him in my time of need. And He meets me with His grace and His mercy. What are we going to do about the sinfulness of this world? And the perversion and, and, the, and the violence and the infidelity and the blasphemy and the idolatry and the lust and the pride. We're going to respond with grace. We're going to respond with grace. Why? Because grace is what's needed. Grace is, grace is all that's needed. Don't make it any harder than it has to be. Calvary's a finished work. Don't go back and try to revisit Calvary. Calvary's done. The great God of all said it was finished. What was finished? He took care of everything that was necessary to cover everything that could possibly ever come. You, you didn't, if you understood what I just said, somebody would be shouting. At Calvary, He took care of everything in that moment that could ever possibly take place in the future events. His grace was there. He said it was finished. The problem is you and I have a hard time comprehending and understanding that as a child of the king, you don't have to live like that. You don't have to live less than. You don't have to live down in the muck and the mire. You can make a decision anytime you want to stand up and say, I'm a child of the king and his grace and his mercy is enough. His grace and his mercy is enough. It's efficient for me in the moment. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to earn my way in. I don't have to do it. No, I'm telling you, his grace is sufficient for you. His his grace is sufficient for you. His grace is sufficient for you. No matter what you've done, no matter what you think, no matter what's been said about you, His grace is sufficient. Grace is the last resort for the hurting and the helpless. 2 Corinthians 12 and 9. And He said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. So how did he respond? Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I'm getting ready to close because God wants to do a restorative work in this place. But here's Paul struggling Paul, the apostle. Paul that wrote so much of what we go to and study out in the New Testament. Paul, the Jew's Jew. The one who studied the feet of Gamal. The one, the one who understood backwards and forwards everything that was there. I mean, he was, he was the man. I mean, if he had an X account, he'd have a blue check by it. He'd have all the followers. And yet he, yet he admits in this moment that I had a weakness. I had a flaw. I had a, had, a, had a struggle. I had an infirmity that I went to God three different times and said, God, please remove this from me. I'm speaking to somebody today. And God said, no. No. Because you don't understand. I'm doing something in you. My grace is sufficient for you. Because when you admit that you're not perfect, and when you admit that you're weak, my strength is made perfect in that. What's he saying? He said, I finally got you to understand. You got all the followers. You got all the accolades. You got all the pats on the back. Everybody knows who you are, but you're not perfect, Paul. You got issues. You may keep them quiet. You may keep them secret. You may think that nobody knows, but I know. And you think this very thing is what's keeping you from becoming everything you need to be. But what's going on is I'm working out inside of you 
the very thing that allows my strength to reign supreme. Because Paul, you need my grace. Paul, there's never a moment that you will ever live that you will not need my grace. And you get in a dangerous position when you think you've got it all together and you no longer ask for my grace. Ladies and gentlemen, we all need it. I need it. I, you know, I, I don't. I don't. I don't live. I don't live inside your head. Thank God. And thank God you don't live inside of mine. None of y'all would be my friends. But here's the deal. We can, we can get ourselves into this mindset. And when things are going good, we're all guilty of this. We tend to drift a little away from God because I wasn't needing you today. You don't have to raise your hand. I'll raise both of mine. I have had more times than I would like to share to where I was not aware of the fact I was acting on my own without Him. And then a little something happens. Anybody ever had a little something happen? And then a little something happens to remind me how much I need His grace. Just a little something to remind me that I'm not perfect. A little something that causes me to, oh, Kevin, why'd you do that? Oh, Kevin, why'd you say that? Oh, Kevin, why'd you act that way? In being transparent, I never call myself Kevin. But I do call myself K.A. K.A., what are you doing? I guess you're in my head now. <laughs> we talk about the heroes of the faith, and we should. But let us not forget the recipients of grace who make God the hero. For we read in the scriptures and it says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Joseph found grace in the sight of the Lord. Moses found grace in the sight of the Lord. A remnant of the Jews found grace in the sight of the Lord. The lowly received grace from the Lord. The humble received grace from the Lord. Paul received grace from the Lord. All the above are people that we expect to be on that list. But there is a name. There is a name, however, whom no one would expect to be on that list. His name was Lot. Lot. Yet the Bible shows us in Genesis 19 that Lot found grace in the sight of God. Lot, Lot, foolish, materialistic, proud, permissive, self-justifying. Lot, he just reeked with sin. I know it says righteous Lot when you get to the New Testament. I'm telling you in Genesis 19, he was not righteous Lot. He was stinky Lot. Lot, who was willing to give his daughters away to keep the crowd at bay. Lot, who fathered children with his own daughters. Yeah, it's messed up. That, 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 that guy, that guy, he receives grace from God. As I was thinking about how to end this today, I was thinking about that. I, I remember reading Max Licato book many years ago. Max Licato, a great storyteller he is. He can write and he can pen great stories. Uh, he and I do disagree doctrinally, but he's a storyteller. He talks about a girl named Christina. She was young. She was 15. She grew up in a remote village in Brazil. Very poor. She slept on a pallet every night. She dreamed of getting away because she'd heard stories about life in the big city and everything that was going on there. And she hated her life. She hated the mundane. She hated having to work for every scrap of food that they got. She hated it. Even though her mom was always sweet, her mom was always kind. Her mom's name was Maria. Maria took good care of her. But she just, in her 15-year-old mind, knew there was much more to life. She was missing out. She was stuck in this little village in Brazil. One, one morning, early in the morning, she 
she decided she'd had enough and she packed up a little little bag and she just left didn't tell anybody she was gone her mother woke up the next morning to realize her daughter had left simply to find a note that said mom i think there's more out there for my life than this i've gone to see what i can discover in the city her mom was heartbroken and distraught she knew her daughter had no money. They had no money. There's no way she could survive. And she knew as an adult what would end up becoming of her daughter because there's going to come a time when she was going to get hungry and she's going to get desperate. And when you get desperate, you do desperate things. So her mom went to the little bit of money that she had saved in the cupboard and pulled it out. She went into the little village town there and she went by a little photo booth and she made a picture of herself. She bought as many copies of the picture. She spent all of her savings got a stack of photos and she rode the bus into town and she went around in the big city. Rio de Janeiro. She's putting those pictures everywhere she can. Posting them here, posting them there, going to hotel lobbies, putting picture bathrooms and bars. She's putting a picture up herself, putting a picture up herself. Eventually, after two days, she had put picture, all the pictures she had up. She got back on the bus to drive back to her home. She's heartbroken. She's crying. She's bawling because she, never, she didn't know if she's ever going to see her daughter again. A few weeks passed by Christina comes down the stairs out of a hotel. Her body's broken. She's not smiling anymore. She's wrecked from endless nights of being able to provide the only way she could have income by selling her body. She gets to the bottom of the stairs and turns the corner. And there in the hotel lobby, she sees a picture. She recognizes it's her mom's face. She begins to cry, her throat begins to tighten. She walks over, she picks the picture up, pulls it off the wall, she turns it over on the back side. It says, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you've become. Just come home. And she did. It's a picture of mercy and grace. Ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you've become. Our great God, our Father says today, just come home. Just come home. I don't know who I'm reaching for today, but I'm reaching for somebody. And I'm going to ask all of us just to close our eyes right now, if you're comfortable with that, and bow your heads. And I'm going to pray, but as I pray, I want you to know this altar is open, and there's a God who loves you, and we all need grace. And it's so amazing that He gives it in abundance. God, I love You. I'm so thankful for this moment we have right now. I'm thankful for Your Spirit that is drawing. I pray, God, as You reach for a heart today, that they would have courage to trust You, to lean into Your mercy. God, that You would just overwhelm them right now with Your love. Bring them to a place where they can establish a right relationship with you. God, do a restorative work in this place as only you can. God, as we bring the brokenness of our life and lay it at your altar, will you take it? Will you make something beautiful out of the ashes of our life? In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I wouldn't miss this opportunity today. I wouldn't. We have no guarantee of tomorrow, but we have this moment. And as I said to you already, we all, we all need grace. We all need mercy. It's prayer time. Will you come?